Uh, in the interest of time, I want to move on to our first contributed session. Uh, Adam Smith is the is the chair, uh, and I'll I'll let him take it away. All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the session, the first contributed session on privacy. So this session will run till noon, and then we switch to uh, lunch and the breakouts in a, with a different Zoom link, as Aaron mentioned earlier. Uh, so just to recap the the format, we've got five talks. Um, and each talk will have a, each speaker will speak for about five minutes and then we've got a couple of minutes for Q&A before we switch to the next talk. Uh, and I'll try to keep people on on um, on schedule. Uh, speakers, I'll ask you if you can to set some use some kind of other device to time yourself. I will cut you off if necessary, but there's no easy way for me to like show you, you know, uh, minute warnings like we would in a physical conference. So. Um, so unfortunately, that puts a bit more burden on you. So I suggest you use a cell phone or something for that. Uh, and uh, I'll ask everybody to, all the panelists to be muted except, except the speaker. And I'll ask the speakers to share their slides. So uh, Aloni, do you wanna just try sharing your slides and we'll see how we, uh, yeah, sure that sure. works. Let's try it. I might get the wrong screen. So let's see what happens. We're seeing your PowerPoint slide. Your slides or UTC speaker view? Right now, we're seeing your notes window. How about now? Now we see, now we've got the right one. Yeah, we've got your slide. Okay, so um, our first talk is uh, on towards formalizing the GDPR's notion of singling out. This is work by Aloni Cohen and Kobe Nisim, and Aloni will get to talk. Um, great, sorry, I'm just setting up my little setup here. Arranging windows. Uh, cool. So I hope everybody can hear me. Thanks for the organizers for having us. Um, and I do want to thank um, Cynthia and Omer, especially for putting this um, this all together, and you know making it possible for the youth, including myself, to you know do this sort of work. Um, uh, so this is joint work with Kobe Nisim, uh, which was recently published in PNAS. Um, and here we go. So the context is data privacy, um, and specifically data privacy laws, which tell you the sorts of things that you have to do or that you can't do, um, as contrasted with data privacy techniques that come from cryptography or differential privacy world or the applied privacy enhancing technology world, which tell you what you can do, give you, give you tools to do certain things. Um, and there's a big conceptual gap between these worlds. So legal laws require legal guarantees, but data privacy techniques give you technical or mathematical guarantees. Um, laws are typically informal, techniques are more formal. Um, and there's a basic, there's a basic mismatch um, between these two worlds, even conceptually. Um, so it's hard. We, we, the question we want to ask is, do the techniques satisfy the laws? Do they help you um, comply with the laws? But the more meta question um, that we're wrestling with in this work is, is it possible to prove to do mathematical analysis that has legal implications? Is it possible to prove legal theorems? Um, so what we propose, what we try to do in this work is move back and forth between legal analysis and mathematical analysis. And in particular, we start by understanding relevant legal texts and guiding documents. And from that legal text, we formalize a mathematical um, requirement. So this is in contrast to what, like the history of cryptography where you, you, you think really hard about the definitions and what you, what you really want to, get, to give privacy. Uh, here we're using as our source of motivation legal legal text, not our own um, thinking about what's important, and that ends up uh, putting us in in a very different mindset. Once we have a once we have a mathematical concept, we can analyze it um, and then hopefully draw legal conclusions. So. In this work, we focus on a particular concept called singling out, which comes from the GDPR. So after you know, we read the GDPR, we understand the concept it's, and its relevance to um, anonymization under the GDPR. 
and formalize something that we call predicate singling out and a security property, which is security against predicate singling out. Um, once we formalize the property, uh, we can study it. We can study its relationship to differential privacy, to canonymity, uh, and properties of, the, of security against predicate singling out, like whether it composes. Um, and once we've done that mathematical analysis, we can draw, we hope to draw conclusions about the legal concept, um, the legal concept singling out as opposed to the mathematical concept predicate singling out. So our goal in defining predicate singling out is to capture something that's necessary for anonymization under the GDPR. And in particular, this, if we, if we do that, it would allow us to refute claims that a certain privacy mechanism anonymizes under the GDPR, anonymizes as a legal matter. Um, so so uh, to anonymize under the GDPR, you have to prevent something called singling out. This is well-established law. Um, and so what we wanna do is to define a technical notion that if you pre prevent sing GDPR singling out, you also have to prevent predicate singling out. Uh, so in a, in a sentence, predicate, because, uh, you know, wa watch the longer talk or read the paper if you want more details, but in a sentence, preventing predicate or um, a predicate singling out attack is given the output of a mechanism, M of X, uh, you output any very rare property that matches exactly one person in the data set with significant probability. And every one of these bold uh, sentences, there's like a reason for it but I don't have time to tell you. Um, and now to, to just give a hint about the results and the conclusions, um, we show that K-anonymity, which is a um, uh, by now 20 year old uh, privacy approach, K-anonymity in many cases allows predicate singling out attacks, which uh, from which we conclude that K-anonymity as, doesn't as a rule um, anonymize under the GDPR. Uh, also, predicate singling out security doesn't compose, uh, which suggests that GDPR singling out, the legal concept, probably also doesn't compose. And finally, the differential privacy does prevent predicate singling out attacks, which is some evidence that differential privacy may prevent GDPR singling out. Um, it's maybe weak evidence that uh, differential privacy uh, is useful to anonymize in the GDPR, but that's, that would be one step further, um, which we don't do in this work. Um, so going back to the meta question, which is, can we prove legal theorems? Uh, we think so, uh, but to do so, you have to really pay attention to the law and pay attention to the text and make sure you're, um, you're keeping your head, you know, keep having a touch point there all the time. That's it. Thanks for listening and thanks for having us. All right, thank you. Uh, so we've got a minute for Q&A. You can uh, post a question on the Q&A form, but actually the preferred format is to raise your Zoom hand. So uh, you should have, if you're an attendee, you should be able to click a button to raise a hand. If you're a panelist, you can type your question in the chat. Um, since I don't see any raised hands, I'll just ask a, um, a, a quick question. You know, to what extent are, um, does this kind of approach overfit to like specific laws and the, the weird process that goes into uh, actually um, making, you know, writing laws? Um, it probably does overfit to specific laws. I do think that we're at this stage, we generally, we, we me, uh, are at this stage where we don't really know how to do better than overfit the specific laws. I think, I think in, the, in the project of proving legal theorems, uh, I think we, we need to start by proving individual legal theorems. And then, and then hopefully we can get an understanding for what it means to do that. Um, and and more generally, the conceptual the conceptual underpinnings of privacy notions in tech in computer science and privacy notions in law are so far apart that we have to start somewhere in bridging them. And I think maybe once we have 
um, more cross connections between those conceptual underpinnings, then we can stop overfitting um, to particular. All right. Thanks. And then while Charlotte, uh, Aloni, can you stop sharing your screen? And Charlotte um, Peel is our next speaker. Maybe sh she could uh, share her screen. And Aloni, a quick yes, no question while that's getting set up uh, from uh, the audience. Did you just read the GDPR or read also related guidelines, interpretations, case law, et cetera? Uh, so we read GDPR, uh, we read some documents, uh, guidelines put out by a group called the Article 29 Working Party Group, uh, which is like interpretations on a previous law, um, and we read some other work in the area. That's great. We talked to, we okay. talked to some. And th that's documented in the paper. All right. Okay, so let's thank Aloni again. Um, our, the next talk, so, so Aloni, uh, the next talk is on bounded leakage differential privacy. This is by Charlotte Peel, Omar Rheingold, and Katrina Liggett. And uh, Charlotte will give the talk. Uh, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Charlotte, and I'm a rising senior at Stanford University. I'm going to give a brief overview of some work we've, I've done with Katrina Leggett and Omar Rheingold in which we define a new relaxed variant of differential privacy that we've termed bounded leakage differential privacy. So to motivate this new definition, let's begin by considering a scenario where we'd like to understand an individual's privacy in a more nuanced way. Let's say we have some differentially private mechanism that's being run on a database. Differential privacy guarantees privacy for all the individuals included in this database, but it doesn't tell us anything about how the privacy of those not included in the database could be affected. Now, why might this be an issue? As one example, consider a study conducted in a small town where participation in the study is determined by some piece of sensitive information for each individual. It seems plausible that the privacy of all residents in this town could be affected by the results of this study rather than just the subset that actually participated. One possible way to get around this issue could be if we imagine that we have some large database that holds the data for everyone in the population and we only run the privacy mechanism on a subset of that database. However, if we tried to apply differential privacy in this setting, we'd have to conclude that an individual would incur a privacy loss for every study run on the giant database, even if the individual didn't actually participate in it. Intuitively, we shouldn't be very satisfied with this conclusion. My privacy shouldn't be affected by a tiny study run on the other side of the world that I have absolutely no connection to. So this brings us to the concept of bounded leakage differential privacy, or BLDP for short, which aims to shed more light on this scenario. Intuitively, BLDP promises that a differentially private release of data in the presence of some bounded amount of leaked information won't degrade an individual's privacy in unexpected ways. Formally, BLDP adds the notion of a leakage function to the standard definition of differential privacy. This leakage function has access to the database and randomness that the mechanism uses to compute its output. It's important to note that the leakage here is not necessarily explicit leakage. It can be more of a thought experiment, just representing an upper bound on some amount of additional information that may impact the privacy guarantees of a mechanism. Our definition then requires that for most pairs of neighboring databases, the probability that the mechanism would output a value in any subset in the mechanism's range, given that the leakage was set to some value O, is relatively <laughs> similar no matter which of the neighboring databases was used to compute the output. We have an asterisk by the for all here because there's a technicality that causes us to ignore certain values, and if you're interested in learning more, feel free to check out the longer pre-recorded version of this talk. So, now that we've introduced this definition, let's return to our example scenario to see what insights bounded leakage differential privacy can provide. So let's say we want to reason about an individual's privacy loss over all the studies ha that have ever been conducted in some world. 
Here, instead of explicit leakage, we're going to imagine that there's some upper bound on the number of studies I participated in. Using BLDP, we can show that the privacy losses I incurs are upper bounded by a value dependent on T rather than on the total number of studies. This shows that I suffers a much smaller privacy loss than we would initially conclude using differential privacy. So one last note is that BLDP also comes with a set of tools similar to the properties that differential privacy has, including post-processing and composition. We didn't have time to include this here, but feel free to take a look at our paper for more information on this. Um, overall, bounded leakage differential privacy gives us a way to reason about privacy loss in the presence of a bounded amount of leaked information, which can give us important insights into applications such as how the privacy of non-participants can be affected by a study. So I hope you now have a basic understanding of bounded leakage differential privacy. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a minute or two for questions. Again, you may raise your hand uh, or you could post a question in the Q&A. Yeah, so I will ask, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> There are various, the, the sort of version definition you presented is in terms of the out probabilities of different outcomes. There are also kind of various uh, versions of differential privacy that talk about the inferred about a particular person based on the outcome that are sometimes referred to as sort of semantic notions or there are various, ter various terminology. But did you guys look at like equivalent formulations of your definition that might be more, give a more intuitive sense about what it, like what it means to have a certain type of leakage? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we are currently working on that. Um, it's not something that we did for Fork, but we've continued to work on it. And so we're working on formalizing uh, some sort of semantic notion of differential privacy and hope to have more results on that soon. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again for your talk. And uh, we'll switch. So um, Moni has started screen sharing. That works. Um, uh, so our the next talk is uh, by Moni Noor. It is on the paper called Can Two Walk Together? Privacy Enhancing Methods and Preventing Tracking of Users. Uh, that's joint work with Neil Vexler. Uh, Moni will give the talk. And uh, Moni, you have the floor. Money, we're, we're not hearing any sound yet. Uh, are you? Can you hear me? Now we can hear and see you. That's okay. great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Adam. And thank you, the organizers, Cynthia and Omer, for uh, this uh, um, conference. So, as you heard, this is joint work with uh, Neil Wexler. So, uh, So let's talk about web cookies. So web cookies uh, were introduced in 1994 in order to help with session management to allow things. Uh, the example was shopping carts. How do you manage a shopping cart? So it looked pretty innocent and it allowed personalization of preferences and themes and everything. But of course, as we know, uh, pretty soon thereafter, it became a major surveillance uh, device. And uh, it's probably uh, used uh, uh, by companies to track users across websites. So whenever you introduce a feature, you want to make sure that you're not uh, doing uh, something like a web cookies, a handle to, that allows tracking. So we would like to explore this in detail in the context of uh, differential privacy. So the example, and it, it really stems from the Google's work on uh, rapport, is the homepage, uh, homepage statistics. Suppose that you have a browser developer who wishes to learn about the homepages of users. Uh, reports are collected twice a day. And uh, this is, of course, you want to learn about them in uh, some privacy preserving manner. We, we, we don't care exactly how, uh, but uh, some noise, some form of noise is added to each report. Now, because you're repeatedly asking people about their homepage, 
uh, about the same piece of information that usually doesn't change, you want to use correlated noise. So uh, a different, the same noise, roughly speaking, is added in different sessions uh, in order to prevent uh, noise uh, removal. So uh, if you wish, think of this example where uh, you have a user, Alice, who in the morning reports from the office and the night reports from home. And uh, very soon, an adversary who tries to identify where she lives pretty soon will be able to see and locate uh, and distinguish between, let's say, two possible IP addresses uh, of her home, simply by seeing that they, they are identical to how she reports uh, from her office. So this is exactly what we're trying to prevent. So what do we have in this work? So we have a new definition of something we call everlasting privacy, which simply means privacy when you repeatedly uh, report things, but the, so this is pretty standard, but the more interesting uh, definition we have is the definition of untracking. We define what it means to that you are not able to track a user. We have composition theorems uh, for tracking and we can connect between everlasting privacy tracking and change point uh, hiding. You don't want, if you, you're going to change some sort of value, if you're going to change your homepage, if you, you do, or if you are changing something, you don't want that to be very uh, transparent. So uh, if you change your name suddenly or something like that, that shouldn't be other people's business. Then we analyze Google's rapport in our framework and show that it doesn't, even though that was their motivation, doesn't quite satisfy what at least our definition of untracking. We suggest a mechanism for reporting single bits with everlasting privacy, and we have a general method for converting local differential privacy into uh, one with everlasting privacy and almost perfect provision of, tra of tracking. So far, the good news, the bad news is it's only for a limited number of sessions. The tracking, the, the privacy is everlasting, but the tracking, uh, the untracking, the prevention of tracking is only for a very limited number of sessions. And we also have results regarding a uh, chaining of two mechanisms and uh, open problems. So um, just to say something about untracking, you want to measure how well a mechanism prevents tracking. And the definition is very much in the spirit of uh, differential privacy. Uh, you, the reports generated by two users with the same value are similar to reports generated by a, a single user, of course, with a one value. So if you cannot distinguish between the, the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right, then uh, the stuff on the left has uh, two users, the stuff on the right has a single user. If this is the case, then we have achieved the untracking. So what's left to do? So uh, we would like to find a lower bound of the trade-off between accuracy, privacy, and the untractable parameters. For instance, in the single bit scheme that is quite simple, uh, and can you find, can you show that it's indeed uh, optimal? As I mentioned, the downside of the general scheme is a rapid deterioration in untrackable parameters once the number of reports goes over the threshold. And uh, one, sim one uh, natural question, is there a scheme with a more graceful degradation in the untrackable parameter? Uh, the, finally, all schemes we considered are what we call permanent state mechanisms, like the, the one in the rapport, and uh, do changing state between executions. Can it help, can it help prevent, uh, can it help it, uh, achieve better uh, untrackable uh, parameters? Thank you. Thank you, Moni. Uh, are there any questions? You can either raise your hand or pose a question in the Q&A. Uh, okay, if there are no questions, I, I have some, but I think in the interests of time, we'll move on uh, to the next talk. Uh, so Moni, yeah, uh, you can unshare your screen. Pasin uh, Manarangsi, uh, you're sharing yours. We can see, uh, see your screen. Can you uh, just check your sound? Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? 
uh, we can see your screen and we can hear you though it's quite faint. Uh, oh, yeah, the okay. sound is, is not, maybe you want to be closer to the microphone. Can you hear better now? That's great. Okay, so uh, our next talk is on private counting from anonymous messages, near optimal accuracy with vanishing communication overhead by Bali Ghazi, Ravi Kumar, Pasin Malarangsi, and Rasmus Pach, and Pasin will give the talk. Uh, the thank you, Adam, for the introduction, and thank you to PC for having us uh, in this conference, and also thanks to everyone for tuning into this talk. In this work, we study the problem of counting, uh, which is also known as binary summation in the distributed setting. In this setting, each user i receives an input xi, which is just a number either zero or one. And uh, based on the input and also his or her private randomness, the user can produce a message yi. These messages are sent to the analyzer, who then uh, produce an estimate of the sum x1 plus x2 to xn. Uh, and we want to do this task privately. Um, we use the notion of differential privacy, which I, I guess um, all of you know. Uh, just to recall very quickly, we have two parameters here, epsilon and delta. Epsilon uh, denotes the e to the epsilon is the uh, multiplicative difference in the probability that we allow, whereas delta is the additive uh, error here. And uh, epsilon we should think of as a constant, whereas delta is something uh, slightly uh, th that is negligible in n, so something like one over n to the log n, for example. So um, we study somewhat uh, non-standard models of private uh, of differential privacy. So let me uh, quickly go over the standard model. So the first standard model is the central model. This is the model where the analyzer can see the raw input data, but only the estimate that is produced has to be differentially private. Another model is the local model, where uh, each message that is sent to the analyzer has to be so noisy that it's differentially private. Now, uh, central DP is great because it has typically has low error, but um, it also requires a lot of trust because the analyzer can see the data exactly. On the other hand, local model require very weak trust assumption, but uh, often it will lead to a large error. So we study a model that is uh, between central and local DP and it's called the shuffle model. So in this model, the setting is very similar to before, except that there is uh, in the middle a shuffler. So the shuffler just takes all the messages and permutes them before uh, sending these messages to the analyzer. And our requirement now becomes uh, that the messages after being shuffled has to be differentially private. And this model is known by many names such as uh, the encode shuffle analyze architecture or the anonymous model. So let's focus on the binary summation uh, problem for the moment. In the central uh, differentially private model, uh, we can get an error of uh, one over epsilon. So this is by the classic work of the work, the very first work in DP. And each user just send one bit, just the input. In the local model, it's known that the tight answer is square root n. And also here, this can be achieved by a mechanism that each user can send just one bit. Now, what about the shuffle DP? So first of all, um, if we just take the local DP algorithm and run it in the shuffle model, we immediately get an increase in privacy, which means that we reduce the error. In particular, this given an error of square root of log of one over delta. Uh, the whole thing divided by epsilon, which is of course much, can be much less than square root n for moderate value of delta. Um, and this uh, brings us to the first uh, resolve of our work. Uh, we show that um, this uh, square root of log one over delta is more or less necessary for any one message uh, shuffle model. So this is a, a shuffle model where each user can produce just one message and send it to the shuffler. Uh, this means, uh, for example, that we cannot achieve the same error as in the central model if we are allowed only one message. So this means that if we want to achieve uh, the same error as in the central model, we have to look at the multi-message setting where each user can send multiple messages and these messages will together be shuffled and sent to the analyzer. So the picture looks more like this. So in this multi-message setting, um, there are known work that actually get the error of one over epsilon. However, uh, the previous work has to use more uh, communication. In particular, the communication is something like lock-in, which is undesirable. 
so this brings us to the second contribution to this work. So uh, we show that uh, we can get an error arbitrarily close to the central model while sending uh, roughly one, just one bit. Uh, in particular, we send one plus some polylog of one word delta uh, over n bits in expectation. And this second term is uh, very small if delta is moderate, like you know, uh, one over n to the log n, for example, the second term is little of one. Um, and just to note here, there is also some recent work that can get a, a PLDP protocol as well. So all the protocol we discussed so far has delta greater than zero. So this new work has uh, delta equals to zero, but the error is not the same as in uh, the central model. Yeah, so I think I'm running out of time here, but if you want to learn more about the low bound or the algorithm, please feel free to uh, watch the longer version of this talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? Again, you may raise your hands or post a question in the Q&A. Okay, so I think um, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next talk and uh, thank uh, Bosnian again for the, the talk. Uh, and so our next speaker is um, Noah Golovich. Uh, Noah, you're sharing your slides. Do you want to just check that we can hear you? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay. okay, so our next talk is on the power of multiple anonymous messages. This is uh, by an overlapping set of authors, Badi Ghazi, Noah Golovich, Rami, R Ravi Kumar, Rosmus Pak, and Amaya Velinker. Uh, and Noah will give the talk. And Noah, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all the organizers for putting this together. Uh, so I'm going to talk about joint work with Badi Ghazi, uh, Ravi Kumar, Rosmus Pak, and Amaya Velinker. Uh, so the starting point uh, for this talk is, is the local model of differential privacy. Um, so I'll quickly review this. Um, here we have a universe U, which is simply a finite set. And there's n users, uh, each of whom has some data point uh, xi from the universe U. And they wish to release some statistics of their data set consisting of their n data points in a way that respects each user's individual privacy. And the way they do this, is they send some information about each of their data points uh, to an analyzer. But we assume that the analyzer is untrusted. So in order to preserve privacy, each user must add some noise to its data point uh, itself. And the way it does this it, 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 is, is that it applies what's known as a local randomizer, which we denote by R. So it's a randomized uh, function, which takes uh, as input a uh, user's data point xi and outputs some number of messages, which the user will send uh, to the analyzer. The analyzer then aggregates these messages and outputs st st statistics. Um, so one issue with the local model, as Pasin alluded to, is that uh, it requires very large errors, uh, even for very simple tasks. And this can make the sample complexity of certain estimation tasks uh, prohibitively large. So uh, the shuffle model attempts to reduce these errors. And what it does is it adds a trusted shuffler between the outputs of the local randomizers and the untrusted analyzer. And the shuffler simply permutes all the messages that it receives from the uh, um, local randomizers before the analyzer can see them. So all the analyzer sees is a bunch of anonymous messages. And the combination of the local randomizer R as well as the shuffler S um, is said to be differentially private in the shuffled model if the mapping that takes the data set consisting of the end user's data points uh, to the output of the trusted shuffler is itself differentially private. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what differential privacy means, this just means that changing one user's data doesn't affect the output of this mapping very much. Okay, so in this talk, uh, there's, uh, we'll make a distinction between the single and multi-message shuffle model. Uh, in the single message shuffle model, uh, each user simply sends a single message to the shuffler. So the shuffler per permutes uh, n messages where n is the number of users. In the multi-message shuffle model, each local randomizer outputs multiple messages so the shuffler will be randomly permuting more than n messages. And what we study is the 
the error that you can achieve with um, differentially private protocols in the shuffle model uh, for the frequency estimation problem. So just to review in this problem, uh, the universe U is simply uh, the set of integers from one to B for some positive integer B. And the goal is to compute the frequency of each of these integers from one to B in the data set. So it's basically the problem of computing a histogram. And what we show for this problem is that in the single message shuffle model, then any differentially private protocol uh, must have added a error, which is polynomial in the number of users uh, n and the domain size b, or the domain size b. So it turns out that this lower bound is tight, and that actually follows the uh, uh, phenomenon um, called privacy amplification by shuffling. So we show that the protocols that arise from shuffling locally differentially private protocols are themselves tight as well. And the way we prove this theorem is we prove uh, new lower bounds on locally differentially private frequency estimation uh, in the regime of low privacy. So you can see our paper for, for more details on that. Uh, but the main question this theorem raises is, uh, can we reduce that polynomial dependence uh, on n and b uh, to say something that's polylogarithmic? And uh, our second main theorem shows that this is indeed the case. Uh, if we allow ourselves to have multiple single um, messages in the shuffle model. So there exists multi-message shuffle model protocols, which are differentially private, and have polylogarithmic error, uh, as well as communication. So the main contribution in this theorem is actually showing the polylogarithmic communication. The error follows from, from previous works quite immediately. And uh, you can see our paper for uh, two protocols that we use to achieve these guarantees, uh, one based on the Kautman sketch, another based on Hadamard response. Um, and we also have uh, in our paper nearly tight lower bounds for the selection problem uh, in the single message shuffle model. Uh, so that's about it. Um, thank you everyone for, for listening. All right, thank you again. Uh, so uh, again, an opportunity for questions if there are uh, quick questions for Noah or indeed any of the speakers of the session. So there's a question from Sumega Garg. Sumega, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask, like, I was intrigued by your improved upper bound on information between V and Rx. And I read uh, the paper a bit, but uh, I don't know what's your intuition for the bound. Like in particular, why does the accuracy bound help in improving the upper bound on the information between V and Rx? Uh, yeah, so you're asking about, um, I guess, I guess our, our, our lower bound for the single message yeah, shuffle model. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you're, and you're wondering what, uh, what exactly the intuition is for that specific expression in that mutual information upper bound? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, the, probably the most intuitive uh, explanation for why it looks like that uh, is really if you look at the, uh, the corresponding uh, shuffle model protocols, which actually achieve that upper bound. So um, th there really this, this kind of, uh, th there's two single message protocols that you could use. Um, one is based on shuffling the output of randomized response. And the other is based on shuffling the output of the rapport protocol. And when you kind of do the calculation and, and see what, uh, what the resulting mutual information between um, V and R of X is for each of these protocols, uh, They'll eventually they'll, they'll they'll come out to exactly what that mutual information upper bound is. Um, so I I don't know if there's kind of uh, intuitive explanation for for why you know it's exactly those you know it, exactly that quantity, mm -hmm. but when you when you look at the actual protocol, um, it come uh, it comes out to that. So so that that kind of um, hopefully gives some sense as to, as to why it looks like that. Okay. Thanks. All right, so uh, thanks everyone for attending the morning session. We're going to break now for lunch and the uh, main conference will, will begin again at, at 1.30 with Ricky's keynote talk. But uh, anyone who registered for this will have received an email from me on Friday <laughs> with a link to the um, Zoom, the separate Zoom meeting that we are going to use for uh, informal discussions over lunch. So anyone who wants to attend that lunch, what I'd like you to do 
immediately after my announcement is log out of this Zoom meeting and then log into the lunch Zoom meeting linked to in my email. Please do that right away, even if you are going to need some time to prepare yourself lunch, because um, I'm going to wait five or six minutes until everyone's logged into that meeting. And then I'm going to create breakout rooms. And you're, you're going to want to be logged in when I do that so that you find yourself in a breakout room. But uh, after you're in that meeting, feel free to, you know, uh, take a five or 10 minute break to go and, and get yourself from some food if you like. And then uh, everyone should return back here to the main webinar uh, at 1.30 for the continuation of Fork.